This is it, the moment I've all been waiting for, the full-on applied beer garden physics deep dive into towing stability and all the stupid things people do <coughs> out there on the road to Dingo Piss Creek. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap <laughs> for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. This question is from a dude named Shane Whip and we will dive in in just a sec. It's going to be quite detailed and long, I suspect, because this is complex stuff. However, I should warn you that this presentation is rated M for mathematics and P for physics and therefore BB for brain bleed. So, Tampax up, ladies. We're going in. From an engineering perspective, what are the most important attributes of a good tow vehicle? Wheelbase, width, height, weight, engine size, suspension or suspension upgrades, tow ball overhang past the rear axle, and tyres. As there are always discussions amongst caravanners about what is the ideal tow vehicle and why, it would be brilliant to hear the why from an engineer. Okay, so Shano has given us a bunch of things there to consider and I just want to dispose of some of them quickly, all right? Things like height and suspension and suspension upgrades. Now obviously they do play into stability but they're not primary stability things because out of the box the vehicle comes designed to do some degree of towing, okay? If the suspension is deficient, then absolutely that will affect dynamic stability and you might need to quote unquote upgrade it. But really you're not upgrading, really you're fixing a deficiency, okay? And if the suspension's not deficient, I wouldn't go fixing a problem that doesn't exist, basically. And the height of all of these vehicles, all the 4x4 utes and patrols and land cruisers and things of that nature, they're all so similar, okay? So unless you've changed the height by giving your vehicle the four inch lift, and then you wonder why it's just not stable on the road anymore, then height's not really a factor. I'd class that as sort of a tertiary thing. But some of these other factors that uh, Shane has mentioned, I'm just having a look at that list, they are kind of primary. So let's dispose of them now. You got grip, okay? So. Essentially, your vehicle is not just a free body in space that's resisting movement. It's anchored to the ground to some degree by those four contact points. And they are absolutely vital. So tyres are a big deal. And I note a lot of people modify their vehicle by putting uh, tougher sort of off-road tyres on the vehicle, okay? And there's no doubt that that interferes with highway stability generally because you cannot improve the performance of a vehicle out there in the rough stuff and also improve its performance on the highway because they roll out of the box with decent tires for the highway and if you're going to do 30,000 kilometer big lap around Schittsville or something then that's where you want the stability and I'd suggest you might do the odd excursion with your trailer, with your caravan, whatever, but most of your driving is gonna be on sealed roads and I would want stability optimized for that, mainly because on sealed roads, you're gonna be doing 100 k's an hour or something, right? And 100 k's an hour is not to be trifled with with three tons behind you. You've got this massive amount of acquired energy and if it all comes unglued, that's bad. So I'd want the maximum grip where you've got the maximum energy in the environment that you are going to be operating overwhelmingly commonly, which would be decent dirt roads in part, but mainly sealed roads. So I'd buy tires optimized for that if you want towing stability. And then in other conditions like off-road, then I wouldn't be towing a three ton trailer off-road, it's that simple. And on dirt roads, slow down. Okay, your highway type tyres or your A slash T type tyres are going to go okay on decent dirt roads. You don't need the big knobbly mud killing tyres for towing and in fact that's going to hurt. Okay, but grip is a major factor because you've only got these four points of contact that have to resist all of the influences imposed 
by the trailer in pitch, like in the vertical dimension here, and in yaw as well when the trailer pushes the vehicle side to side. It's essentially overwhelmingly the contact patch that's resisting most of that. And wheelbase and also track to some extent, but the track is so similar, right? Wheelbase is a big factor because if you imagine, let's just do a thought experiment where we get, you know, the podger of truth, the flogger of truth, and we reduce the track and then we reduce the wheelbase and we end up with just the same amount of grip but concentrated kind of in the center. We basically get this concept of reducing the wheelbase and the track to an absurd degree and see what happens to stability when you do that. And when you do that, you're basically towing something with a one wheel, right? Like, you know, the one wheel, that skateboard with the big wheel in the center that all the vloggers in Canada use? Well, you don't want to tow with that because it's tremendously unstable and obviously if you could go the other way to an absurd degree and pump the track out to here and pump the wheelbase really long it's even harder to start nudging the vehicle around so obviously wheelbase and track and things of that nature have an impact on stability but I'd once again suggest that all of the vehicles that you would tow this kind of thing are overwhelmingly similar so if you're debating the relative merits of uh, Triton versus Hilux versus Ranger versus Land Cruiser and you're using wheelbase as a defense then in a sense you've already lost your argument and it does astound me that there's these arguments around campfires from the beard strokers right the one thing that I always find hilarious about that is none of them train themselves in applied physics. And this is this would be like having 20 people sit around talking about the relative merits of the different ways to transplant a human heart. And the only thing is none of them are cardiothoracic surgeons, but they've all got an opinion, right? And that's kind of what happens around campfires. Yeah, because all of these people, they might have towing experience but they don't understand the physics. So they end up going down these rabbit holes that are secondary at best and irrelevant at worst. So you've got relative size and mass, and we'll get to that in a minute, okay? Because it's important to have a much heavier prime mover, if you like, relative to the trailer. You've got more stability when that relativity is the greatest, okay? Heavier prime mover, lighter trailer, maximum stability. And for everybody who is motivated to comment now, oh, well, trucks don't work like that. Trucks are different, dude. Like, if you can't see that, should have gone to spec savers, all right? Because here's your average semi-trailer, which in America they would call a tractor-trailer combination, okay? You've got these big groups of axles right at the back end, and the front end of all of this mass that's being carried is right over the top of the driving axles of the prime mover. The wheels are in the corners. It's maximally stable. It's designed to be like that. Towing a caravan is completely different. Like towing is an afterthought on a ute, okay? We'll get into that in some more detail about rotation and movement and things like that in just a sec. But the other thing that matters here is the load distribution, right? Because you've got all of these different masses and it really matters where they are, okay? We'll get into that in some detail too, but I'd suggest it's much more important to put heavy stuff in between the back wheels in the tub of your ute, okay? And that's the curse of the tub really, isn't it? Because they're inconvenient to load, particularly because they're up high in a dual cab and you've got to lift the heavy stuff up there and then you've got to climb up in it and move the heavy stuff in between the wheels and that's inconvenient and it leads to this sort of laziness loading phenomenon where the heaviest stuff ends up up the back of a tub and for this reason a drop side tray is better because it's easy to load from any position around the load space. The other thing I want you to be aware of is that in a dual cab ute the wheels are essentially right at the front of the load space at the back okay they're not in the middle of the load space they're right up the front in fact they abut the passenger cabin. That's how this works. Look at them all, Hilux, Ranger, Triton, whatever, D-Max, all of those rear wheels are right up against the back of the load space, okay? So where you put the load in the back really matters. How much influence the trailer has really matters. You know, if you hang a big bull bar off the front, we'll get to that as well. I'm not sure that helps a lot. It's better to have 
as much load as possible in between those four contact patches because you can imagine in an inertial sense when you're going around a corner or something of that nature these masses in here the five people the engine if you manage to put the heavy shit in between the back wheels it's all in the middle of these four contact points and it can't therefore act like a pendulum in the way that a mass here can or a mass here can or masses here can so the way you load your vehicle is going to be pivotal to its stability in a corner for example okay so that's kind of important vans are like that as well right or trailers generally because i'd suggest there's a big difference between a big beefy trailer with three tons of sand in it or total weight three tons probably two and a half tons of sand and 500 kilos of trailer, something like that. There's a difference between that because the sand is really concentrated, right? And a van, because a van is big and long and tall and shape really matters. There's this thing called I, which is uh, an engineering variable. It's called rotational inertia. And there's so much semantic promiscuity about it, mass moments of area and things like that. It's all really discussing the same stuff, which is that different shapes are harder to spin or easier to spin, more resistant to spinning, able to exert more load on whatever when they are spinning. And we'll get to that as well. But I just want you to think, you know, your ute's not a truck, it's a light duty vehicle. All of these things uh, matter when it comes to stability, but they're not all equal. And hold that thought. So here's some common utes and land cruiser. Okay, these are the sorts of things you actually see out there in the boonies on the way to Dingo Piss Creek actually towing heavy shit. Okay, you've got your Ranger Wild Track in this. I used Wild Track because the weights vary a little bit and I've got to be specific about the variant. But Ranger is essentially the same as the previous BT50 as well. So there's two vehicles right there. And here's the D-Max. Okay, I've chosen X-Terrain as the variable there because it's the heaviest one. And that's equivalent to your current BT. All right. And we've got Hilux, we've got Triton, and then we've got 200 Land Cruiser. Okay. So when you look at this, I've ranked them in order of descending wheelbase from longest to shortest. Okay. So you've got your 3.2 meter wheelbase for your Ranger and your 2.85 for the Sahara. Okay. And they descend like that. And the difference is like 150 and 220. So it's 370. It's about that far in, well, it's that far, in wheelbase, okay? A bit over a foot, 14 inches, okay? It doesn't actually make that much difference, does it? When you look at it like that, because nobody's arguing out there around campfires that Land Cruiser Sahara is a shitter towing proposition than a Ranger, quite the opposite, okay? So wheelbase is not the variable that people think it is around the campsite. It's just not, okay? And when you look at the length of these vehicles, it's not the variable either because Ranger is coincidentally the longest vehicle with the longest wheelbase. It's nearly five and a half metres long, whereas your Land Cruiser 200 is just under five metres. So there's a lot of difference. It's like that much difference, right? That's a big difference in length. And if length was really a determinant of towing capability, stability, things of this nature, then... Land Cruiser 200 would be the shittest vehicle at that, okay? And here's what I reckon really matters, okay? Look at the curb weight. 2740 for the Land Cruiser. Two tons, the Triton's the lightest one at two tons. And then you've got, you know, 2.2 and a bit for the others, 2.1 and a bit for the D-Max and BT, the current BT, okay? So when you look at the weights, it's a no-brainer. With everything else pretty similar, you know, the footprint on the ground and the everything else, the height, for example, and the track, okay? Didn't even bother listing the track. It's like this much in it. So the biggest determinant here in towing stability is the weight. It's what I said earlier. It's the weight of the vehicle versus the weight of the trailer because everybody, all the beard strokers who never studied applied physics, they're all sitting around the campfire stroking, going, oh mate, the Land Cruiser 200, she's a beauty for towing. And it is, and it is because it weighs 2.74 tonnes. And Shane also mentioned the powertrain, which is kind of important for getting up hills and cruising effortlessly, but not all that important for stability. It's also got the most grunt, 
Okay, so you need the most grunt to overcome the most mass, and it's got overwhelmingly the most grunt, so it's overwhelmingly the best tow package. Unfortunately, it's overwhelmingly twice the friggin' price of most of the utes out there doing the towing, and this is why many people don't go for the cruiser, they go for a ute, and you've got a cop on the chin, the reduction in stability and the greater difficulty in achieving safe, heavy towing. That's important. Okay, so I almost didn't go here, okay, at all, because, you know, eruption of blood from the ears, and at school, you know, if you were good at science at school, they try and stay on planet linear when you talk about physics, because things that happen in a straight line are just so much easier to understand. You know, straight line phenomenon, yeah, we're getting it. As soon as you do spinny stuff and you have to go to angular world. It's really confusing. Even the name, why do they call it angular? Well, it's movement through an angle, okay? So angular speed, angular acceleration, angular velocity, rotational inertia, all of these things. It's time to Tampax up, ladies, because we're going in, okay? When you learn Newton's three laws of motion, arguably the hardest one is Newton number two, which, uh, if you want to know formally, it says that the time rate of change of momentum of a body acted upon by an external force is inversely proportional to the mass of the body and directly proportional to the applied force. Yes! What the fuck does that mean? Okay, what it basically means is, if you're at home having dinner on lockdown this evening and a zombie kicks down the door and you pick up the flogger of truth and you beat the zombie in the head with it, in a decisive way, by way of saying, no, I'd rather you didn't eat my brain or my family's brain, if that's okay, then the force that Flogger of Truth applies to Zombie's Cranium is going to make Zombie's Cranium accelerate, okay? And the amount of acceleration is going to be proportional to the force applied during the impact and inversely proportional to the mass of Zombie Cranium. Okay, so if you've got a fixed amount of force, then more mass means more resistance to acceleration. Bigger mass, littler acceleration, smaller mass, bigger acceleration, that's how this rolls, okay? And it's just the same as if somebody, you're sitting at the lights in your ute, right, and somebody liberaches you, okay? The amount of acceleration of your vehicle is gonna be proportional to how heavy your vehicle is and how hard the shunt is, okay? And that's why bigger vehicles always fare better in the same impact than smaller vehicles. Because if the impact is fixed, if it's the same dickhead texting who doesn't see you stopped, even though you're in a bright red Hilux or something, and he shunts you, then if you're in a Land Cruiser, you're not going to accelerate as fast as if you are in a Yaris, okay? So... Mass really matters, essentially, is what Newton's second law says. And unfortunately, we can teleport across to angular world and our brains can just erupt with blood through the years because every one of Newton's laws has an angular equivalent. And this basically says force, mass, acceleration on angular world. It's torque, angular inertia, like rotational inertia, and angular acceleration. So with angular movement, it's just the same as linear movement. You've got displacement, velocity, and acceleration. So displacement on planet linear is going from here to here. We've displaced the flogger, okay? And we can displace the flogger at a constant speed or we can accelerate it out there. So you can have linear velocity, linear acceleration, and you end up with displacement. You get the same thing in angular terms, right? So you can displace something through an angle and it's got angular displacement and you can move it at, you know, you look at a crankshaft rotating around 6,000 RPM, it's moving 100 revolutions a second. So its angular speed is like 360 degrees times 100 is like 36,000 degrees per second kind of thing. If you want to do it in strict physics terms, it has to be radians per second, but, you know, Tampax up twice if you want to get into that. So here's the thing about angular anything. Shape 
really matters with angular anything, okay? Because not all masses spin the same. Big compact masses spin differently to elongated masses that weigh exactly the same, right? You've experienced this. In fact, I'll show you now. This is a 25 kilo bag o pelletized chook shit, which is roughly 30% of my body weight. It's pretty easy to lift, but not entirely trivial to carry endlessly up the stairs. When you pop it up, you can spin around okay, and it actually just feels pretty normal. But this is three metres of treated pine, about 125 to 150 in diameter. That's five or six inches. Marika, said the actress. It's roughly the same weight as the fertiliser and just as hard or easy to carry up the stairs. But it's much harder to spin, and once you get it spinning, it's much harder to stop spinning. It actually feels a bit kooky like that. It's got the same mass as the chook shit, but it's a vastly different shape. Much harder to rotate more rotational inertia. So you've felt that, right? If you've picked up a piece of wood ever and put it on your shoulder, or you picked up a you know, big long piece of wood or a crowbar or a big length of pipe or anything of that nature, and you've gone like that, you've gone, well, you know what, this isn't that heavy, but Jesus, it's hard to spin. Almost everyone's felt, everyone who's not a politician has felt that. Even if you're an electrician, you pick up a piece of conduit, it weighs nearly nothing. It's actually a little bit hard to spin, right? Because of its shape. And if we did a sort of first order approximation of your ute and we thought about its rotational inertia, so its resistance to rotating like this, okay, in your, then let's just make it a big thick piece of steel plate that weighs three tons, okay? And it's got a center of mass vaguely in the center of the plate, okay, geometric, geometric, and <laughs> geometric center of mass, okay, and the rotational inertia is something you can calculate, this is the bit where you bleed from the ears, the square of the length plus the square of the width times the mass divide by 12. And I'm going to tell you what, where this matters, okay, if you double the weight and leave the shape the same, then you double the angular inertia, rotational inertia, okay? But if you change the dimensions by the same amount, you make a distinctly different change to the angular inertia of something, the rotational inertia of something. Because it depends on the square of something. So if you double it, you end up with four times this and four times that in the calculation, all right? So the shape and the size matters more than the mass in that respect. Okay? And this matters for the trailer as well, right? Because your trailer could be a compact box trailer full of sand or a big fat van, and they could both weigh three tons, but they spin really differently. And when they do start to spin, like rotate, then they're harder to stop when it's a van, even though it weighs the same as a trailer full of sand. So your vehicle is operating in extremis as far as the manufacturer is concerned when it's towing a three and a half ton trailer. But a three and a half ton caravan has the ability to exert more disruptive influence on your vehicle than a three and a half ton trailer full of sand, okay? That's kind of important for you to realize as well because not all three and a half ton loads are the same. And that brings us to disruption, right? Because the trailer has the ability to disrupt the vehicle. And I'd suggest that out of all the things that caravanners talk about, around the fire. What's the best thing about stability with tow vehicles? How do I make the vehicle more stable? All of those conversations that go down that track, they fail to acknowledge the fundamental truth that the biggest influence in stability with vans is the weight of the van and its shape, okay? It's much more of a factor than the vehicle doing the towing. It really is because there's so much variability of vans. Like a 1500 kilo pop top camper van is virtually nothing. It's not trivial, and you shouldn't treat it like it's trivial, but that it's easy for the vehicle to restrain the disruptive influence of a van like that, okay? So a van like that just doesn't have the same nudging capability. It's like shrinking this to a quarter of its size and trying to beat that zombie to death with it. It's going to be just less effective. I hate that. 
So you've got to think also about what happens when things are unscripted out there on the road because you've got your van like this in pitch. Pitch is like this. All vans move in pitch. They're basically a seesaw because the, the uh, axles are in the centre and their centre of mass is about 10% forward so that it gives you this sort of 10% download, yeah? Because you need the download for stability. And the reason you need that is if you go into a ditch or a bump or something like that, then the mass centre is going to push down here inertially. It's going to physically accelerate this way and it's going to go like this and it's going to push down on the tow ball and that's better than pushing up. If you had the centre of mass out the back here somewhere and you went over a big enough bump, you know, on impact, this would act like a seesaw the other way. It would pull the tow ball up instead of pushing it down. This would tend to lift the rear wheels of the tow vehicle off the ground. It would unload them to some degree. I guess in an extreme situation, they might come off the ground. But usually unloading is enough because, you know, load is the load on that rear axle is keeping those wheels gripping the road, which you need to get around the corner to make the van rotate behind you and follow you around the bend, okay? So you don't want the van to unload. And the other way this disruption can occur is in yaw, okay? Because the van can pivot like this. It's got to pivot like that to go around a bend. Every time you go around a bend, it's translating around the bend and yawing at the same time. And at the end of the yawing part of its motion, it's got to track straight ahead. So in order to get it to track straight ahead, the vehicle has to tell it to stop spinning. Otherwise, it just wants to start to keep spinning. That's like Newton's first law, okay? So the other thing that is a bit of a brain bender with all of this is you, both of these disruptions can occur at once. So you can go over a bump, doom, like that, and you can be in a corner at the same time. And that's kind of challenging, isn't it? And you could even be in an off-camber corner, <laughs> right? So when that happens, the rear wheels of the tow vehicle get pushed to the ground because of disruption in pitch, okay? And that means the steering gets less effective. So you might feel the combination start to drift wide or push, okay? And then you whip in a bit more lock because that's a scary situation to be in. Okay, you whip in a bit more lock and you might get a bit more grip or you might get a, a bit more grip in a couple of seconds when the stability in this plane of pitch is resumed, okay, but then you've got the wheels pointing too far around the bend, you're kind of over nudging the vehicle into too tight a radius now, and the trailer's very confused because it started to yaw in response to your increased steering, and now you're telling it to straighten up, and you might hit another bump, or the camber might get worse, or whatever, and all of a sudden you've given the trailer enough of a disincentive to stay straight ahead, that it's starting to turn into a pendulum behind your vehicle. And you definitely don't want that. So I'd suggest that the biggest factor out there on the road that plays into the stability is not the vehicle doing the towing. It's the vehicle being towed. And the vastly different number of combinations out there, big tanks full of water here, a lot of heavy shit loaded into the back, who knows? Because if it's a box trailer, then you know, it's easy to put the heavy stuff up the back, isn't it? You can unload the tow ball. If you haven't weighed it, how would you know? If you're towing a car, for example, cars are really high and really long as well, right? So they've got a lot of rotational inertia and they're also quite wide. So they, they have a rolly type influence on the trailer as well. And all of these things can happen together. And that's sort of really depressing because there's only so much compensation you can do as the driver. What you're really relying on is the fundamental stability of the combination. So getting it sorted out is like, dude, it's really important. Now, the beard strokers, right, are really big on overhang. Overhang behind the rear axle. Like that matters, okay? What really matters here is where is the vehicle yawing around? So yawing is this kind of spinning dinner plate motion. You have to do it every time you go around a corner, okay? If there's some sort of violent interaction between the trailer and the vehicle, there's a force exerted this way or that way. 
by the trailer, okay? And it causes the vehicle to yaw. And if for some reason the rear end unloads a little bit, then the rear wheels might lose traction somewhat. And arbitrarily, the vehicle might start to spin around this point, like that. It might just start to spin that way, which is really scary if you're holding the steering wheel, okay? So what really matters here is the length of this spanner, right? Because the longer the spanner, the greater the torque causing the vehicle to spin. Okay, so it's not really the length of the overhang behind the rear axle. It's really the length between the force that the trailer's applying and the vertical axis about which the spinning motion is occurring. And obviously if both wheels have got grip, then the point of that the vehicle is yawing around is somewhere in the center between the wheels. Because the front wheels are pointing this way and the vehicle's spinning and it's gonna be near the geometric center, okay? So it's really this distance that matters every time. Although I'd suggest that this sort of quote unquote overhang distance is more uh, applicable, if you like, to the failure of the chassis in bending that you see all the time, the banana ramification of utes that get overloaded, heavy trailers and heavy loads over a bump equals banana ramification. So let's talk about that in the context of how you'd best avoid it. So here's a complex diagram that's really just representative of your ute and what it really is in structural terms, which is two pieces of chassis joined together going for a drive down the highway and a whole bunch of loads imposed upon them. And I've kind of tried to make the proportion right, even though I'm such a shit draftsman, <laughs> okay? So the only thing I've really botched is this leaf spring here. The leaf spring front attachment point is really back here near the join between the load space and the cabin, okay? So that's a bit out of proportion, but everything else is pretty much how utes roll, all right? So when you think about the loads that are imposed upon a notional three-ton ute, okay? Three-ton including the load, all right? You've got your three-and-a-half-ton trailer imposing 350 kilos on the tow ball out here. Typically, you've got your heavy shit in the back because it's easy to put the heavy shit in the back when you're camping every day. You just lift it in like that. You don't have to then climb up and lug all that heavy shit here where it should really go. Okay, and then you've got your engine and transmission and all of that stuff pressing down on the chassis here. You've got a kind of distributed load of everything that's in the body, including the people and any accessories you fit that are, that's imposed at various points on the chassis here. And ditto with your load space. You've got this distributed load here, heavy shit in the back because maybe you're lazy and you didn't lug it forward where it should be sitting. And in terms of responding to all of those loads, all of these loads pressing down like that, even your bull bar up the front, okay? You've got the springs, the attachment points here are stopping the chassis dropping onto the road, okay? So you've got two vertical forces here in the case of a leaf spring or one in the case of a coil because that's what restrains the load, okay? And then you've got one vertical force here where the front suspension is, okay? Obviously, these loads are duplicated on the other side, like you can extend that out into this plane and you've got two, four forces here and two forces there, one for each wheel, okay? The problem with all of this is you've got a cabin that's rigidly mounted to the chassis, more or less rigidly mounted. There's rubber in there, but it's bolted, okay? So this allows some additional stability of this region of the chassis, right? And the same thing with the tub or the tray because it's mounted at various points to the chassis. And that increases the rigidity, if you like, of this part of the chassis. But there's an air gap in here, right? There's nothing bolted across the chassis between the tub and the cabin. And just think about this when you overload something, okay? You put all of this additional weight here, which is the worst possible place for a heavy load because it's way out here. If this is a seesaw, this is a fat kid sitting right up the end, okay? And you've got to ask yourself, what's the failure mechanism? What's going to happen when all of this goes pear-shaped? And the obvious answer is failure is going to occur here in bending because this is the weakest part of the chassis and that's going to happen. 
And you don't actually see banana ramification at all. You see this turn into a hinge, right? And it's not meant to be a hinge, obviously. There's no coming back from it being a hinge. It's quite amusing for everybody driving past, very depressing for you on the road to Dingo Piss Creek. So you think about this, you've got your really heavy three and a half ton trailer. The chassis can't see the trailer. It just sees 350 kilos here. The little S's here are for static, okay? But hardly anything with a vehicle is static. You're driving on some shit road and you go into a piece of bulldust that's sort of bottomless and the, the, the van falls into it and all of a sudden the wheels here are climbing up out of it so they get a big shunt this way right when the van hits the bottom of the whatever you just hit and so it's accelerating this way this turns into I don't know 1400 kilos or something and this turns into an accelerative shunt this way that's the recipe for a hinge right because this is what happens and you go past the yield point of the chassis right here, it goes plastic, the deformation becomes permanent, you're on the sat phone, right? Get me out of here, not pleasant. Okay, so this is why I say that it's a great idea to load these vehicles conservatively. Don't tow three and a half tons, don't tow three tons. Tow two and a half tons, you'll probably be okay. Don't overload the load space. Make the extra effort, put your heavy shit up here because this is a bit of a spanner too, isn't it? You know, all the heavy shit is a bit of a spanner. And you've really got, a, you've really got to care about this if you're going to do 25,000 Ks across the shittest roads in the country. Because there's no coming back from this, right? And this is really why I say that these vehicles are light duty vehicles. And I'd suggest that Shano, who's doing a good job, he's done 25,000 kilometers, he's done it safely. But three tons worth of ute and three tons worth of trailer is right at the operational limit of vehicles such as this. I know your general thoughts on pedestrian shredding crash safety compromises, but would adding weight to the front of the tow vehicle, such as a bull bar and winch, help to stabilize the towing vehicle, especially in dual cab utes, with so much weight behind the rear axle. Now on this issue of bull bars, okay, and I know bull bars are tremendously popular and I'm not a supporter of their popularity. I think they're just dangerous because there's no way they can have no effect on airbag deployment. People fit bull bars because A, they're a fashion accessory. Everyone's got one. They want to be part of club dingo piss and you can't join unless you've got a bull bar. But let's think about this. The, the, the notionally rational reason for fitting a bull bar is to protect the vehicle from animal strike. And I get that. If you hit a kangaroo, it's going to damage your vehicle and you don't want to do that. So the countermeasures there that you might employ alternatively is do an advanced driving course, learn how to brake. That always helps. Swerving, so effective. Not so good with a caravan behind, of course, and you have to drive with that in mind. So you could drive at times when kangaroo strike is less risky, less likely, okay? Like not at dawn and dusk and not in the middle of the night. You could always try that, okay? You could drive at a reduced speed as well. So fitting a bull bar, yeah, it'll protect the vehicle against animal strike, no problem. But if you are in one of those horrible worst case scenarios where the van nudges the vehicle off the road and you are aimed at the only gum tree for like 100 k's and it's this big, then that's going to be a life-threatening crash for you if you hit it, okay? Because any crash that's faster than about 65 kilometers an hour, your survival really is up for grabs. And thousands of engineers for, I don't know, 30 or 40 years now have really diligently approached the topic of how to protect you by energy management. And these systems are very complex and very cleverly worked out in the time domain so that they can extend the duration of your interaction with the car during a crash. And this happens down at the millisecond level. You will not remember it, okay? If you fit a bull bar to the front of your car, it will change in some way the dynamics of that interaction and it won't be a positive change. Physics says, it won't be a positive change, okay? So the bottom line here is that I don't see any bull bar manufacturer 
crash testing a vehicle with their bull bar with the hominid dummies in place and releasing that data. I just don't see it. They've got this sort of bureaucratic bear ba uh, you know, bear airbag certified kind of mentality. And I don't know who does the certification, right? But there's certainly no invitation for the public to come and watch the crash test. And every time I've seen uh, organizations, a few mining companies have done it and the data has kind of leaked and their vehicles with bull bars have always crashed worse when it comes to protecting the occupants, okay? So what do you value more? The sheet metal around you or your life and the life of your family? That's my position on bull bars. Now, as to can 120 kilos up the front improve stability? It might improve the weight on the front end a little bit if the trailer is really heavy and it's tending to do this to the vehicle and lift the front wheels off the ground. But the effect is going to be minor because there's not very much cantilever over the front and there's going to be additional negative factors as well, such as a reduction in ride height when you're not towing and reduced ground clearance, more weight on the front end, more tyre wear, things of that nature. So in general, I don't think fitting a ball bar and a winch is an effective countermeasure if the problem is towing instability. People often refer to the tow vehicle's tear needing to be a certain percentage of the trailer's weight, but shouldn't it be the loaded mass of the tow vehicle that's more important? Similar to a truck and dog situation where it is considered dangerous to drive with the truck unloaded and the dog loaded. When you start to push the three and a half ton towing limit in the current range of dual cab utes, you need to lower the tow vehicle's weight, which seems counterintuitive. Look, I get the point of these kinds of discussions where the tear weight is in some way related to the trailer weight, okay? But what really matters here is the weight of the vehicle actually on the road versus the weight of the trailer, okay? It's always good if the vehicle doing the towing is heavier than the thing being towed. And when I say always, I don't mean trucks, okay? I don't mean trucks. Someone's gonna say in the comments, I get it every time I say this, they go, oh yeah, well semi-trailers don't work that way. Tell that to a B-double, dude, right? They're different. They're just different propositions, okay? Trucks are carefully designed to stay on the road despite their huge weight relative to the prime mover. And in fact, the whole business of trucking is to maximize the efficiency of the carriage of load, okay? So maximum load, minimum weight of truck, because you don't get paid for the, the weight of the truck you deliver to its destination. You get paid for the weight of, I don't know, LCD TVs or dead chalks or whatever it is that you're trucking from A to B. So it's a completely different proposition with trucks. And I'd suggest that although many utes are rated to tow three and a half tonnes by the manufacturer, it is completely unrealistic because if you take a Ranger, for example, it's got like a, a gross combination mass of six tonnes. So if you're towing three and a half tonnes of trailer, the vehicle doing the towing, the Ranger, fully loaded with you and all your shit in it, can only weigh two and a half tonnes and it's like 2.2 something dead empty, right? So that's just fundamentally ridiculous. It's ridiculous to drive around Australia like that. Like two people, okay, and their stuff, like personal items, 200 kilos, bit of recovery gear, some water in the back, maybe a jerry can of fuel for those, and some, you know, basic stuff, okay, a couple of swags, whatever, just in case you decouple and you go out exploring for a couple of days, okay? It's completely unrealistic to expect you to be able to comply with everything you need to comply with to tow three and a half tons. And in fact, with a dual cab ute, I'd suggest that three tons is right on the ragged edge of what you should be doing. So I get why people say the tear weight as a percentage of the trailer and all that stuff, because the tear weight is known, whereas the weight of your ute in its best spoke loaded condition is not known. And there is some relationship between them because you can only fit a certain amount of stuff in the ute to tow a particular weight. So I guess there's a loose relationship between those two, but what really counts is the thing doing the towing, your ute with its shit in it, needs to be, in my view, for safety and longevity and all of those kinds of things, right, as opposed to just legal compliance. Let's think about safety. For safety, it's really good if the quote-unquote prime mover of your convoy 
is substantially heavier than the trailer. FYI, I have the mental illness as I am one of those Dingo Piss Creek visitors. <laughs> We are towing a three-ton caravan with a ranger that is also constantly loaded at three tons approximate weights. It seems to tow quite well, and we are 25,000 kilometres through our lap of Schittsville. The two-litre bi-turbo also has plenty of power, does not hunt through the gears, and returns reasonable fuel economy. As long as the engine and gearbox last the distance, I think it's a pretty good combination. Would love to hear your thoughts. Shane, up front, let me say thank you very much for your question. It was so well thought out, gave me the opportunity to do that whole informational dump. And also, I am genuinely pleased that you are out there having a good time in your Ranger doing what you love. And I know I piss take the Dingo Piss Creek adventuring crowd all the time, but it's only because I've sort of been there in the outback so often and I've seen all those people. And it's a caricature of the way reality really is. And I think most people, there are some indignant dickheads in the comments, but I think most people genuinely can relate to at least some of that stuff. So anyway, the only point I'd make here about your 25,000 kilometre lap of Oz, and I need to thank you as well for telling me how the powertrain's going in your Ranger. I have read numerous reports about heavy towing with the 10-speed 2-litre by turbo engine and the hunting thing. I'm glad that's not happening to you and I might tone back my impression of that in the future as a result of direct feedback from you. And I mean, 25,000 Ks, dude, you've been doing it a lot more than any journo who goes out there and does a tow test, right? You're living this particular dream. So thanks very much for that. The only thing I'd say here is when you say to me, the Ranger that's constantly loaded at three tons and you're towing a three ton caravan, and you're talking about approximate weights, okay? You're right on the edge of the gross vehicle mass. So what I would do if I was you, I'm glad that it's towing okay, but you've also got to think about compliance. So if approximate weights means maybe 3.1 for the van, we don't really know, and maybe 3.1 for the ute, like, yeah, 3.1 today, you know? I'd get the combination way, dude, because you don't want to get stopped by some inspector at the roadside and told that you are 200 kilos overweight, here's your fine. Plus, P.S., you're not going anywhere unless you lose 200 kilos of your shit. Now, that might be as simple as emptying a water tank, okay? Or it might be a complex proposition indeed, depending on what you are actually carrying. So that is a risk, okay? And... I'd suggest that for everybody contemplating towing, you know, towing something heavy, if you're sitting there on your ass now and you're this far through this video, you are thinking about towing something heavy, three tons, three and a half, whatever. Don't do three and a half with a three ton, with a dual cab ute, okay? Just don't do it. It's impractical. And even at three tons, you are right at the ragged edge of what is safe and feasible and things of that nature. So just give it a second thought and see if you can't come back to two and a half tons because I suspect most people out there contemplating this living Shane's dream expedition once lockdown ends or, you know, Christ knows, then you really are going to be happier if you can fit your life into your ute and a two and a half ton van. And if you've got to go to three, that's absolutely on the edge of what you should contemplate given the ability for disruption capable, built, embodied in the capability of a three-ton van. Like, once it's rotating in your or pitch, it can do a hell of a lot of nudging to your vehicle. And I'd really like to see you get to the end of your dream in six to 12 months or something and get back home intact. Nobody wants to get dusted off by the flying doctor in the middle of nowhere. And it can take a hell of a long time to get medical assistance in that kind of environment. And really, this sort of conservatism, and I know this is like a grim way to, to wrap up any sort of video on this stuff, and I do try to be lighthearted from time to time, but you don't wanna be in that position. And that's why I piss take the Dingo Piss Creek crowd all the time, because there is no Dingo Piss Creek and there's no quintessential beard stroking dickhead. He's a caricature of everything that's wrong with somebody who might make the wrong choices touring the outback, okay? You don't want to be that guy.